question, we go straight to our second speaker for the day. Um, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Mari Pangestu uh, to the stage this morning. Uh, my name is Natasha Hamilton Hart. I teach international business here at the Business School at the University of Auckland. Um, Dr. Mari Pangestu is Professor of International Economics at the University of Indonesia, which is Indonesia's most prestigious number one university, and also a senior fellow at Columbia um, School of International and Public Affairs. She is on many corporate and public sector nonprofit boards. She serves as an advisor to a long list of governments, organizations, and international bodies and firms. She is a distinguished fellow at the University of Hong Kong, and she was in 19, 2018 distinguished fellow, won the Distinguished Fellow Award by Eisenhower Fellowships. Perhaps to many in this room, Dr. Mari Pangestu it will be best known as a former trade minister of the Republic of Indonesia, where she was Minister of Trade from 2004 to 2011, and thereafter Minister of Tourism and the Creative Economy from 2011 until October 2014. As Minister for Trade, she led international trade negotiations and cooperation for Indonesia, and she thus has very first-hand insights into the multilateral trading system and the regional responses that she is going to speak on today. I will also add that Dr. Mari Pangestu is known within Indonesia as a champion of Indonesia's internationalizing, liberalizing coalitions, and has been a voice for rationality and reform for many, many years, and I, I will share with you, you will, I first met you in 1997, but you will not remember because I was a lowly PhD student at CSIS, but thank you for your hospitality then. Um, I will hand over the microphone, or you have your, your microphone, please, um, uh, you have the floor. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate ATAPS, I hope I got that right, Auckland Trade and Economic Policy Study School, the S's school. Uh, I hope that this is a, uh, going to be another center in the region where we can be having collaboration across the Asia Pacific. So because I'm Asian, as uh, Richard said, I'm gonna start with an apology. <laughs> <laughs> that my, my slides are uh, less colorful than, than Richard's. <laughs> and, and I would say too wordy. Uh, I, I really like the way he, you, you had your slides just then. But anyway, uh, I thought that today what I would like to do is share uh, the theme about disruption and disruptors uh, and take it from an, a very ASEAN uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, obviously it, it has implications also uh, for a regional in, uh, cooperation as well as for what, how New Zealand uh, should also see its role uh, within this context. So uh, I would like to just uh, talk about three themes. Uh, the new normal, you know, what is it that uh, we in ASEAN and obviously the rest of the world are facing? What has been the impact on ASEAN so far? Uh, and what needs to be done? some ideas about responses and strategies. And given my background uh, and knowledge and experience and exposure, a lot of it will be on uh, what we should be doing uh, with relationship to trade. So before we talk about the new normal, uh, let's talk about the old normal and how that's benefited uh, the, the region, uh, especially in East Asia. I think uh, ASEAN, East Asia, uh, many, many emerging and developing countries, uh, in a way, we were very lucky for the last three decades uh, prior to the current uh, disruption. We faced a very conducive world economy where we were able to grow uh, and develop. And you know, there are lots of numbers on the hundreds of millions that were alleviated uh, from poverty. Uh, and a lot of that in East Asia was driven by mark what we call market-driven uh, integration. It wasn't necessarily because we had FTAs. But it, a lot of it was driven by unilateral or domestic uh, reforms, but they were shaped 
by our regional and WTO commitments. Obviously, the accession of China to the WTO being a, a very big story uh, in, in that context. FTAs is kind of a more recent uh, uh, development in the region, so market-driven integration has been uh, more and more important. And of course, you had U US, EU, and advanced country re leadership, or what I would call the tailwind on openness uh, for a rules-based multilateral trading system and use of uh, dispute settlement for trade conflicts. So uh, in the old normal, uh, if US and China uh, had a, a trade issue, which they did uh, over uh, the course of, of the time from the time uh, China was uh, a WTO member to, the, to now, uh, you would take it to the WTO. You know, Indonesia had disputes with the US, take it to the WTO. Meanwhile, the rest of our uh, economic bilateral relationship continues. So you can uh, isolate the, the issue and, and find resolution in a third party, in an arbitrary, in, you have an arbiter in the WTO. Uh, and all, the, all, our, all our bold unilateral liberalizations were underpinned by our international and regional commitments. And we had this, um, I guess, the second unbundling, in, to use Richard's uh, language, uh, export, second unbundling export-led development strategy. A lot of it was based on low labor cost uh, and, and other uh, comparative advantages. And we had also competitive liberalization because you were competing with each other uh, to attract trade and investment. So that, that's kind of the story. Uh, and you had the evolution of production networks and global value chains very much in the second unbundling world. And technology played a role mainly in the development of transport and telecommunications uh, technology. And especially the development of internet, this, the, the, the lower cost of telecommunications allowed you to coordinate production in, in different parts of the world and allowed the global value chains uh, to, to emerge. So that's the old normal, just to remind ourselves where we came from. And now we are in the new normal. The world has changed dramatically, whether it's the trade issue, the technology disruption issue, the climate change issue, and therefore the responses and strategies can no longer be business as usual. And in a way, uh, Richard has provided a really good introduction to this topic on the technology story that what we thought, you know, it can't be business as usual because extra, extrapolating the future based on what happened in the past is no longer valid. There are so many different parts that are moving, uh, which makes uh, the world much, much more difficult uh, for developing countries uh, to think about the future development strategy. And ASEAN, in ASEAN, we are at different levels of development. We have least developed countries, such as Myanmar, uh, who are just trying to uh, start their development. But in a way, they have the option. They can actually leapfrog. They don't need to do this, what is it, a flying geese pattern or global value chain, which part of the manufacturing global value chain do I graduate to anymore? They can actually leapfrog. Uh, and Myanmar is, is uh, a country which has leapfrogged in the telecommunications, internet tele uh, technology sense. And I think they went from zero uh, mobile penetration rate to almost 75% mobile penetration, mo mobile penetration rate in like two years. Uh, and you are seeing a lot of what uh, freelancing type work uh, emerging in Myanmar. So that's just to show you, I think, for the, our friends from the Pacific Islands, uh, that it, this is some things that are happening uh, even in, in ASEAN. In the, in the more middle level developed uh, uh, ASEAN countries like Indonesia, we are struggling, you know, where do we go next? We, we, we can't go the industrialization path that, that seemed to be the, the mode of the past. We, ha we see the maturation of global value chains in the manufacturing uh, world uh, and uh, robotics is displacing our competitive advantage in low, low cost labor. So where do we go? Uh, what's the path that we should be uh, defining for ourselves. And the more developed countries of obviously are really having to think through uh, how do we take advantage of the services, innovation, and technology. So even ASEAN itself, you have kind of three levels of development that you have to deal with. And it's happening at a time of great disruptions and uncertainty. 
so Richard said that uh, we have to talk scary and uh, to, to get your attention. So uh, believe me, in, in ASEAN and in, in my uh, country, this is all we talk about. What do we do? We have all these things um, on, are happening in front of us. The slowdown of the global economy and trade, trade tensions, geopolitical hotspots, technological disruptions and competition, the future of jobs and jobs of the future, sustainable development and climate change. So I'm not going to talk about all the disruptions. I'm going to focus just on the first two. I think we've had a really good discussion on the third one. And uh, I think there will be others uh, later on in the day who will talk about the other issues as well. Let me just start with the recent development, which is the slowing down of trade uh, after the global financial crisis. And there's a big question out there. Is this slowdown just because of the global financial crisis? Is it cyclical or is it structural? And there seems to be some evidence that it is also structural. So that trade as a trade in goods, as a source of growth and development, uh, is becoming questionable uh, ag again, right? So this is an important issue. And here, the takeaway is that before the global financial cli crisis, when, when uh, the economic growth is 1%, you could get 2 or 3% uh, trade growth. After the global financial crisis, this thing seems to have changed, where 1% of uh, economic growth is only going to yield 1% of trade growth. This is trade in goods. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I think this is the whole, all, all of trade, right? So this is, the, it became a question, uh, and IMF uh, and others have tried to uh, kind of disaggregate uh, the, the issue and try to figure out what's happening here. Uh, why did the uh, trade elasticity uh, or the relationship between trade and income come down? And uh, they tried to look at it by sector, by, uh, by uh, region, and so on. And they found that within manufacturing, trade growth declined more, and especially uh, in the subsectors with greater vertical specialization. This is your electronics, your automotive, which is the global, the global value chain in manufacturing. And what was happening was uh, what we call maturation of the global value chain. In the beginning, you had huge growth because different parts were being produced in different countries and there was a lot of trade going on. So if you take an Apple phone, uh, only 6% of the value added is in China, actually, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and they were importing components from everywhere, from Japan, Korea, US, Europe, as well as other uh, ASEAN countries. But 10 years later, uh, the, the domestic value uh, added increase because more and more components were being produced in China. So that, that's, and therefore, less trade was happening. That, that's kind of the story that emerged. And this is the services story. Uh, interestingly, the elasticity did come down for goods, but actually remained stable for services. So, and you can see the maturation in the global value chain of production uh, in um, uh, machinery and transport equipment. So in other words, services has to be part of the answer uh, for the future uh, in terms of trade. And I think uh, re what Richard was saying and what Sherry will be saying later will, will be, uh, will will uh, tell you the, the story, the importance of services trade. Uh, and some of the possible explanation for the structural slowdown in world trade is very important. This is still evolving. I'm not sure there's a conclusion yet. Uh, but I think the main conclusion is that we are seeing a changes in the global value chain of manufacturing, uh, whether it's ma because it's matur maturing, more local pr procurement, and I think the changing nature of the global value chains itself. Uh, the surfacification, I hope I pronounced that right. I always get, <laughs> it's a very hard word to pronounce, uh, of, of the global value chains. That's, the, that's the, how it's going to be transforming in the future. And that's where the question is, where we, sh we should be uh, put, positioning ourselves. I'm talking about developing countries. Where, where should we be pos positioning ourselves? And how do we um, uh, uh, use trades continually uh, in, in this context, export orientation, industrialization is no longer the only way you can go. It, I don't think it's totally gone. It's not like tomorrow it's already gone. I think it's a, it's a, it's a process of transformation. You know, uh, if I, I, I don't dare to predict, but you know, is garment uh, 
uh, production or footwear production using low-cost labor, a sunset industry? Is it gone? No, it's not totally gone yet, but it may be gone maybe in the next two to five years. So I'm giving a range uh, because it is already happening uh, where our footwear and our uh, garment manufacturers are already migrating to automation and using robotics. Um, so that we need to think about the evolution of global value chains in future, or uh, what did you call it? Services value chain. Yeah, uh, that's the future. But how, what is it going to look like? And where should we be positioning ourselves? And what should be our policy responses, both domestically as well as regionally and internationally? I think that's kind of uh, where uh, we are uh, putting ourselves in, in terms of the policy questions. Um, and uh, this is just another picture showing the, the stagnation of, of the world uh, trade uh, since the global financial crisis. Um, so now let me go into the trade tensions and the trade systems. Uh, what is uh, this new normal? We can talk a lot about it, but let me just highlight a few things. Uh, first is that even before the trade war, even before Trump entered into the scene, even before breakfast, Brexit, you had emerging cracks in the system already. Uh, we already had issues with the multilateral trading system, uh, with the stalled Doha negotiations. So since 2008, I, I was a very unfortunate uh, participant in that whole uh, saga of the of the kind of the stall stalling of the Doha negotiations, where we really got stuck in 2008 and we never really got out of it, uh, and not addressing a lot of the new issues on the agenda. So you know, in the last Eight years, you could say, you, we had a switch to, before 2016, we were switching to mega regionals. You had the TPP, you had uh, ASEAN Economic Community, and then in 2011, uh, the beginning of uh, RCEP. And then you also had, remember EU-US TTIP? We don't talk about it anymore. <laughs> but it was there. <laughs> and uh, effectiveness of the single undertaking and consensus approach was already being questioned. So the whole notion of Pathfinder, plurilateral agreements uh, was already being uh, discussed. What was the other word? Variable geometry, is that right? Um, and weaknesses in the system of whether you're you know, having transparency and monitoring commitments and updating rules. This has already existed before the trade war. And I think a very important fact is the emergence of China. Uh, this is just some numbers, how, how much uh, China uh, really uh, entered into the world, uh, I would say, uh, end of 90s, beginning of 2000, where they really grew six times and their trade grew ten times. And even, um, you know, the, the, the international, uh, internationalization perspective that the U.S. had at the time was, let's bring China into the system. Uh, and that's the way to get China to start sort of uh, playing by the international rules. And I would say, in, in a sense, that was the way to go. And, but at that time, uh, there were already concerns with lack of transparency, trade and uh, distorting policies, uh, and uh, economic and geostrategic competition for influence, U.S. versus China. We were alre already experienced experiencing that, I would say, in the last, especially in the last 10 years uh, prior to 2016. So the two elephant story that I had yesterday is, or it had already started. And you had all these um, kind of maybe mistaken notions that uh, the U.S. Uh, is influencing the region in the trade sense by using TPP, and China was using RCEP. You know, in a way, it's, it's mistaken, but it was simplified uh, to that kind of um, discussion. Um, the new normal, something is broken. Since 2016, uh, you had Brexit, you had the election of President Trump, we had increased protectionism and national po nationalist policies. You had a lot of, dem this is very bad demonstration effect, uh, if you like. And I think most importantly, the U.S. is no longer the defender of public goods of global economic order. You know, this is all the things that uh, the U.S. Uh, has done in the last uh, two years. What, what, did, what was the word Richard used yesterday? Incoherent, um, <laughs> strategically, strategically incompetent, etc. Uh, and the fact that you are using tariffs as a tool, no longer the internationalist approach, and it, we know that it's not just a trade war, it has so much other dimensions to it. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, something also changed. Uh, Japan has increasingly also become 
playing a role in championing the public good. This is good. So this is kind of the beginning of a story. Who ha who's going to step in when uh, one of the major powers that used to be the defender of the uh, public good of global economic order steps out? Who steps in? Uh, and we think it should be a collective leadership uh, kind of stepping in. Japan has sh uh, partly shown the way uh, by uh, playing a key role in co concluding the CPTPP. So I'm not sure how the US perceives this. He, he, he said TPP is the worst agreement we ever signed, let's leave it. Uh, but then the CPTPP uh, now exists. You know, so what does the US, uh, what does that mean for the US? We, we don't quite know because it well, was a strategically incompetent uh, view, you know. Uh, and uh, Japan has also played a continued role in uh, regional in initiatives. And, you know, after so many years of rather cold relationship with China, uh, you can see that uh, they are also warming up uh, their relationship with China. And they played a key role as a chair of G20. Um, I think we all know that the trade, t trade tensions are not likely to be resolved soon. Uh, you, next year, the US, or I would say even now, you're already in election mode uh, for 2020. And that's part of the, of, the, of the color and the atmosphere that you see in the way uh, President Trump is conducting his policies or his um, uh, incomprehensible uh, tweets. <laughs> uh, a lot of it has to do with election, and you can bet that all, and you can see it in the, in the debates as well. I think the, whether you're Democrat or Republican, the issue of China is, is kind of bipartisan. That the, uh, the kind of the anti-China uh, view or the anti-trade view uh, is, is somewhat bipartisan. We can have a discussion on this, but uh, it's not gonna go away, in other words. The, the method may be hopefully a little bit more rational and a bit more coherent, uh, but it, it's not gonna go away. Um, because we do have this issue of the emergence of China and all the trade issues that are yet to be resolved in the trading system. And uh, uh, I'm just going to uh, quote other studies that have been done on China. Our China uh, representative here can, uh, and can explain better. But what, I, what we hear is that in China itself, the way the on and off trade negotiations uh, of, and the approach of Trump has not helped uh, the reformists that would like to have reforms in China address those issues happen. Uh, and it is the reformists were actually thanking Trump that by, by putting the reform agenda uh, clearly on the table uh, in the Chinese uh, political uh, and uh, economic policy uh, priority. But then the, the nationalists uh, got a strong win of support when, when Trump, in a way, tried to bully China uh, into saying, okay, you've got to do these reforms. And China said, well, yes, this is all our reform plan. It's all been approved by uh, the, the Politburo and by all our processes. And then the US turns around and said, yes, yes, but we want to make sure you do these reforms. We want to have a say in the laws that you change. Not only that, we want to have a say in seeing that you actually implement what you said you were going to implement. And that was just too much, right? So the nationalists then said, well, no, we, we, can't, we can't take that. So then you have in China itself, for those who you want to do the reforms, uh, also uh, uh, having some dilemma. I'm not sure I'm uh, summarizing that right, but uh, this is what I hear from some of the analysts who follow this uh, closely. So you have a hardening in positions, if you like, in both countries. So it's here for the long term and it's very complex. You've got unfair trade in there being defined as trade deficit in goods, and increasingly, it's been mentioned a few times, currency manipulation as an export subsidy. And that's the way you justify the use of tariffs. National security, uh, we saw it in the case of steel and aluminum, and we, we saw it being linked to technology, and I think we also saw it in the Japan-Korea uh, uh, situation, and it can be increasingly used. And national security is just this black box that uh, countries can do it, and it's very, there's very little um, rules, I guess, uh, and principles in it. Complex, I think I explained this yesterday, you have the overlapping of US economic, business, technology, and security interests in a multipolar world. And I think the issues on the table 
are really all these issues which are part of it is uh, issues, part of it is uh, about rules. It's about IPR, transparency, market distorting policies, technology transfer, industrial subsidies, and technology competition, and data flows, data governance, and all that. So, um, why is this important? Yes, it's important, we know, because uh, I think yesterday we had this discussion. Is it already having an impact? Is trade tensions that is causing greater uncertainty uh, having impact? Yes, it's having impact, all kinds of impact, in a very uncertain way. Um, and trade war creates, at the same time, opportunities and challenges for ASEAN countries. But I'd like to say that, yes, but uh, I think the greater damage on the world trading system is more negative for ASEAN than any opportunity that they can gain uh, from uh, the trade war. Uh, there's a survey done by PECC Many of us here are uh, members or past members of the PECC network. And it's showing that uh, increased protectionism and trade wars is number one concern uh, by businesses uh, in affecting uh, their growth for the economy in the next two or three years. And the, what they will do is, this is, com this is coming from a McKinsey survey, you will be investing or increasing operations in one or more countries and investing more in local supply chains. So these two, I think, are, are issues when you talk about domestic policy or uh, international cooperation that needs to be done. Uh, these are the things uh, that, that will be very important to think about. Uh, this is just calculating the export similarity you know, of Chinese exports to the US and uh, uh, comparing it to uh, where you would go uh, to get uh, other sourcing if China was facing uh, tariffs on these products. And you find that uh, out of the ASEAN countries, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam are going to be the main gainers because of the, mainly because of electronics uh, parts and components. Whereas Indonesia is on the lower side. We are really only going to get export diversification from garments uh, and footwear. Uh, and India also uh, similarly. So um, this is a, a picture uh, of the global value chain. So if China gets hit uh, and the, the whole global value chain gets hit, the countries that are uh, exporting to China uh, for the intermediate products are the ones that will get hit the most. So it's the white parts of this uh, graph, which is intermediate uh, products. So Malaysia gets hits the most and Vietnam uh, and Singapore and Thailand. And Indonesia, because we are not part of the global value chain in electronics, uh, we, are not, we are least affected. Uh, so um, there is this whole uh, opportunity for export diversification and investment relocation. Um, and really, if you want to be attracting the investment relocation, this is the, 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 the discussions that we have in, in uh, ASEAN, then uh, the domestic reform agenda is key. For Indonesia, it is about, a lot of it has to do with labor policies, uh, trade facilitation, investment climate, and the key is the availability of the supporting industries and local inputs and raw material. So what you want to do is attract a whole, perhaps the whole hub to relocate. I think that's what's going to happen. And in the uncertainty, as we talked about yesterday, what you're going to end up is maybe China plus one, US plus one kind of world where you don't want to just rely on one hub to supply uh, you know, a whole range uh, of products, uh, components, and even services. You'd want to be spreading it, uh, diversifying your risk. And, and how would that will look like? We don't quite know yet, but I think ASEAN should position itself because we already have an ASEAN uh, free trade agreement within us. and then. We also have plus ones, including with New Zealand uh, and Australia. And now with RCEP, that's going to even make a bigger difference in terms of developing a regional value chain, not just with manufacturing, but also with services. And as I said yesterday, we have to be careful as ASEAN. This is a big dilemma. We've got to be friends with both and not enemies with either one, uh, or China or the US. And this is really a, a kind of a balancing act that we have to play bilaterally as well as in the regional and uh, multilateral context. And you know, beware of the double-edged sword. I think I mentioned this yesterday. Uh, China, uh, Vietnam increased its export, but also got a special mention by President Trump at G20. And let's not forget 
the Executive Order on Trade Deficit of 2017, uh, which really put 16 countries having a deficit on the US, uh, with the US, and uh, you know, the US having the right to uh, really investigate you for unfair trade. And four countries in ASEAN have a deficit with the US. We are actually only number 15, but we, get, we get a lot of attention uh, from uh, the US in, in the bilateral relationship with, we have with the US. And the US refuses to look at the trade deficit to include services. We tried so many times in so many ways to say, look, if you put services in there, you don't have a trade deficit with us. It doesn't work. Uh, so somehow or rather, uh, not sure which uh, century he lives in, but that, that seems to be an, another battle to be, what, to be uh, fought. Um, and then we have, we are still on the uh, Section 301 IPR watch list. And for, for countries like Indonesia and a number of ASEAN countries, Thailand, uh, India, the GSP with the, the withdrawal of the, the threat of the withdrawal of the GSP, which is the general system of preferences of tariffs, uh, has been used uh, to put pressure on us. India actually said, okay, take back your GSP we're still gonna do whatever we're gonna do, right? Indonesia, I, I felt that Indonesia should also do similarly, but I, uh, I'm not a government person anymore, but, <laughs> but I, I think this is something, is it, is it worth to fight? It's about 10% of our exports. I suppose some uh, sectors especially would say, yes, it's worth the fight, but let's make sure that we don't give up a lot uh, to get that. So um, just to give you a flavor of, uh, a, that's not US-China a trade war. The flavor for US-Indonesia bilateral talks is that we are being uh, pressured, if you like, uh, for the US to want us, to, in terms of linking it to G GSP withdrawal and um, other uh, things about not being put on the list of uh, playing unfair trade, we are being asked to uh, look, uh, remove our, our requirement for localization of server, national payment gateway, and some foreign investment uh, restrictions. And Indonesia, as China and many other countries, we also pursue, uh, we have to be a little bit schizophrenic in a way, we also pursue the, the deal-making approach that Trump uh, loves, yeah? Which is, okay, we're buying your goods. Uh, I call it voluntary import uh, strategy, not voluntary export restraint, but voluntary import strategy. Uh, yes, we're buying your soybeans, we're buying your Boeing jets, and we're buying cotton for our textiles and garments industry. And we are investing in the US. You know, it's, it, this is uh, played by all countries, uh, including China in, in the US-China. Okay, finally, what needs to be done? What are the responses and strat... How many minutes do I have? 10 minutes, okay. What needs to be done? This is probably the most crucial question. What are the responses and strategies uh, that we in ASEAN, uh, we in Indonesia, think about? Okay, uh, I think uh, Richard, uh, and I think later Sherry will talk a lot about this. I think we, are, we have to look at the, the, the transformation that's happening because of technology, because of the transformations in the global value chain that we are gonna see a, a, a different fragmentation of production and sourcing uh, in emerging. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of the old story of the free flow of goods, services, investment, and people still matter, and probably in services matter more uh, in terms of, uh, it especially of people. And when you say people, it doesn't have to be physical movement of people, but uh, what, what did you call it? Telemigration, you know, that kind of delivery of services without the movement of people, which you, you said there's no regulations, but there could be regulations that impede it or would want to impede it. And it's not just about the trade side. You get, you get into taxation issue, you get into all kinds of issues uh, that we, did, we do need to um, pay attention to to make sure that we have an impeded flow of services, uh, to make sure that we can take advantage of the, of the Digitech uh, in, in the way we can uh, have new sources of growth, new job creation, uh, and, and that actually matters a lot for uh, developing countries, emerging countries. The, the potential to leapfrog, I think, is something for uh, smaller countries, emerging countries, I think the Pacific Island nations. I mean, uh, Richard had lots of examples of um, what did you call Upwork, yeah? Uh, in, i just give you a very concrete example. In Indonesia, uh, we take advantage of this platform in Australia. 
called Design 99 Design or Design 99 Design, as well as Freelance, similar type of uh, platform for services uh, uh, delivery, and it's a logo, web design, uh, all kinds of things that require a design, not, not the data entry, but design. Yeah, because data entry will, will eventually be replaced by robots anyway. But design uh, and conceptual creative kind of design is still, I think, something maybe robots at the moment are not able to do. Uh, so we have uh, examples of uh, people in the village, uh, farmers during the day, and at night they are designing logos and web design, which they export. Uh, their, the, the design to these platforms. These platforms do it based on competition. So whichever co uh, design is the best, they win the competition and then they get paid. Sometimes it's $200, sometimes it's $400, sometimes it's $1,000, uh, and they can increase their income by 10 times. Okay, where is the role of government? It's not there, except to provide the telecommunications infrastructure. The rest is actually no government intervention yet. Yeah. I think you were saying Philippines and Kenya have specific policy. In the case of Indonesia, no government, but uh, how do you overcome the barriers? They don't speak English, yet all their customers are international. They use Google Translate. Okay. Second, they don't have a banking account. They don't have a bank account. What do they do? They collectively have a PayPal account in this one village. They pick one person as the leader, and then they have a PayPal account. So you can, and then they felt that they don't have design because most of them are just middle school graduates. They went to Jogja, uh, talked to an artist to teach them how to, what is design and how to do good design. So uh, I think if the government would actually want to play a role, they could in facilitating all those uh, barriers that I, I just mentioned. But I think uh, this is a, a potentially a whole new world that we don't know about. And, uh, and, and it's happening without government, organically. It's happening in Indonesia organically and in, in, in many other countries. Jogjakarta is another example. We have, you know, Indonesia has uh, the best hackers in the world. <laughs> we win all the hacking competition. Uh, but all these hackers are actually now being, a lot of them are being gainfully employed. Uh, to, to see whether you can actually break into a system, right? Uh, so these are a, very, a lot of potential there. And now, of course, uh, what uh, we know, the free flow of data has become the, uh, a, a very important part of the discussion when we talk about uh, importance of openness. Uh, and with new bus business models uh, emerging, digital and data flows, uh, Digitech, uh, and the digital economy, uh, but it as I said earlier, the, the, the issue goes beyond just having free data flows. Free data flows is part of it. Um, but when you talk about free data flows, you have to think about the security issue. But when we talk about trade in goods, we also used to talk about the security issue, right? Secure trade and so on and so forth. And you have privacy issue, you have taxation issue and so on. So there needs, there is a whole discussion going on uh, partly it was done in the G20 also. You need a global governance on this. You need, you need to, have to begin to have uh, regulations and issues on that. Uh, and uh, that, that's something that needs to be uh, done. So my, my basic, those of you who have listened to me before will know this is my, my formula, a three-pronged approach. You need to do all three, unilateral reforms, uh, which still have to be predicated on regional and multilateral commi commitments. You have to strengthen your regional uh, efforts, and you need to also uh, uphold the multilateral trading system. Unilateral reforms, I won't go too much into detail, but you do need to address all those issues that we talked about. Um, and uh, you need to have, uh, you know, you, ha you have to figure out what is the new, my new development strategy, given all these uncertainties and transformations. And I do, we do need to think about sustainable development. Uh, and we need to think about technology innovation and development. Uh, on the regional front, uh, we need to really focus on how regional agreements can play a, a, a key role in pursuing and continuing the openness that we need. I believe that there should be collective leadership between ASEAN and middle powers such as Japan, as well as Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, and we can play a role in the regional as well as in the uh, WTO uh, sense. And I think 
Regional agreements can play a very important catalytical role because we can already, and we have already started to address some of the issues which will be in, in the end also be addressed in the WTO, such as e-commerce. Uh, and we can also provide different pathways to broadening and deepening regional integration. Uh, and I think the most important hope for outcome this year is the completed completion of the negotiation of the RCEP. So again, going back to the regional value chain potential that, are, that is there. And um, India is at the moment one of the more difficult uh, partners there. And we need to emphasize to India, look at services. You can play a role in services. I mean, they're really like really afraid of the manuf having to compete uh, in the manufacturing uh, trade with China, for instance, but they can be very competitive in services. So that's the kind of argument we need to make. And Japan's leadership has shown leadership in CPTPP. There is talk about expanding CPTPP, uh, expanding members, and whether CPTPP provides the new benchmark for the level of ambition that you should aspire to. So RCEP can, in the future, uh, in its built-in review, uh, think about uh, those uh, higher levels of ambition. APEC, I think APEC, G20, Belt and Road Initiative, Indo-Pacific, these are all kind of non-negotiating fora where you can uh, use this fora to set principles, norms, priorities, and signaling of political will. And these are important um, fora where you can, um, uh, you can uh, play a role in, in spearheading something, you know, uh, like WTO reforms or making sure uh, we have the right sets of issues on data governance uh, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to mention APEC just because uh, New Zealand's going to be a chair in 2021. This is kind of the sequence of international meetings that are happening in the next four years, and they all happen to be in this region. Malaysia is chair of APEC in 2020, so we're going to have a Putrajaya vision for APEC beyond 2020. New Zealand follows on uh, on implementation, and Thailand on in 2022. This is this is Bogor, uh, Osaka, Manila in in 94, 95, 96. If if it may not be in that way, in that sequence this time, but just to outline to you the potential. And Indonesia will be the chair of G20 in 2023. So that's uh, I think important. The final thing is the bilaterals with major trading partners with Japan, EU, and uh, Vietnam. Uh, finally, uh, importance of safeguarding the multilateral trading system. I think the uncertainties created by the serious threat to the multilateral trading system is more important than any benefit we can get from uh, investment relocation and export diversification. And we all, ASEAN, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, we have a great deal at stake that and we should be worried about US and China or any lar other large powers behavior without the constraint of the multilateral trading system. And since we know that US-China trade tension is going to be here for us in the long term, uh, any G2 deal actually harms the system if you're making the deal uh, outside of the system. So we, we need to better deal with these issues under the multilateral umbrella, all these uh, issues that we talked about earlier. And uh, what do we need to do? We need to do we need to safeguard it, which is the dispute settlement system. Uh, we, we need to, it's very, the time is already very close, right? When, when is the appellate body? February, February 2020. So it's very, in, just in the next few months. So if we, we can't get the change of rules to the satisfaction of the US, it's not clear what the US wants. We can't rescue the dispute settlement system in all the different formulations. We need a backup plan, and one of the backup plan is WTO minus one, minus the US, that is. We can talk about that. Um, and we need to build back the confidence in the WTO by making progress in some of the less contentious issues, such as transparency, fisheries subsidies is almost completed, apparently, uh, and capacity building and duty-free and quota-free for LDCs. Uh, improving, uh, you need strategic and political will. You need the collective leadership to address the new issues. Uh, and uh, these four are important because of the membership and because of the leadership it can play. But it, at the end of the day, they need to bring in the broader membership uh, of the WTO. But they can still play a very important role. And these are just some of the sets of issues uh, that, that I, I can list. We can talk about it. Uh, IPR, the competition policy level playing field, data flows, and e-commerce. Uh, 
Um, I think, serve, let me just say something about server localization because I think Richard had, what was it? One, two, three, what? A classification of data. And that's exactly actually what Indonesia is trying to do in the server localization. Defining what you need to keep locally uh, is the number three. Basically, the strategic, sensitive, and exclusive uh, uh, that you can keep in your country, the rest uh, can be uh, uh, free flow. You know? So I think that's, that's some of the discussions that are going on. But uh, finally, this is very sensitive. Um, China, India, South Africa, not agreement to this. Indonesia is kind of, I think, trying to find a middle ground. I think we do need to address the development country issue. Whether it's removing SND is another thing, but we do need to uh, address it. It's not getting rid of SND and going to a US for categorizing definition, but we need to start a discussion on the developing country issue. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I think I've probably run a little bit over time, but hopefully not too much over time. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Mari Pangestu. Um, we have 10 minutes and we have quite a lot of questions. So I'm gonna try and group a couple of them together. We've had um, a couple of questions about the multilateral trading system and the WTO and You've already talked about some of the things that need to be done, but one of the points that was raised um, by Stephen Jacoby is, can you expand on the possibility of having a dispute settlement system revived without the US? If the US doesn't want to play, is it actually feasible to have a system inside the WTO or reviving that or extending the life of that <laughs> without the US? Um, I'm not the expert, I'm just going to uh, tell you what I've heard, and I'm probably not the most up-to-date on this. Some of the people in the room who are following this more closely probably can supplement it. But I think uh, if you don't have the appellate uh, judges nominated by uh, 2020, February 2020, then uh, you can't have a dispute settlement because you don't have a panel of judges. Uh, then what would happen, you go back to the old GATT system of um, uh, solving disputes, which is bilateral, uh, what did you call it? You try to solve it just between the parties having a dispute. Uh, and you can uh, create a panel at the end to abdicate, uh, to, uh, you know, the panel is created just for that particular issue. Uh, and that, that can still happen, right? That, that's kind of option, option one. Option two is um, it's, the, the dispute settlement issue is not just about the judges. It's also about uh, updating and reviewing the rules, some of the rules that are, um, are problematic, not just for the US, but for others. So uh, we could foresee you know, an, up, an agreement to update the rules. Uh, and uh, the nomination of the judges, I was told, doesn't really need total consensus. It can be done uh, minus the US, right? But do we dare to do it? That's kind of the question. That's kind of the, the, the discussion that I've heard. Uh, so you could, uh, you could end up um, agreeing uh, on a, a new set of rules and uh, the judges even, or you could, have, you could have two options. You could agree on a, a panel of judges, permanent panel of judges, uh, appellate body, uh, or you could just do it like in the old days where you just do it by issue, yeah? It can be either way, but you would wanna still continue it, whatever the US does, right? Uh, and what would that mean? It would mean that if you had a dispute with the US, it's quite possible that the US will say, no, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to go to, I don't, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't agree, I didn't agree with the rules, I didn't agree with the nomination of the judges, therefore I'm not gonna, um, be subject to this dispute settlement. So they'll just stay out. So you, you, it, it will affect uh, all disputes that you have with the US or the US having with, with us, I suppose. Yeah, it could be that they just say, okay, if you have a dispute with me, I'm not gonna use it, but if I have a dispute with you, <laughs> I can still use it. You know, we, that, that's something uh, to be determined uh, in the future. But I think we have to have a plan B. I don't think we should just let everything lapse uh, and then go back to, to the way it was before uh, just because we can't uh, agree on anything. We need, we, uh, the rest of us, need to, con need to continue to come to some agreement. And later on, 
uh, the, if the US wants to come back, they can come back uh, to join the system. Thank you. Um, staying with the theme of disputes, uh, in the um, regional PTAs that you have mentioned as being on the agenda currently under negotiation, do you see a role for ISDS, investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, in the nego trade negotiating agenda going forward? Uh, at the moment, uh, we, at least in our set, we decided not to have ISDS just because it's just uh, become very contentious. So for the time being, I, I think uh, we have decided not to have ISDS uh, in, 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 the, in the investment component of the, of the regional agreements. Right. Um, I have a couple of questions about ASEAN and Southeast Asia and how it might um, respond to the challenges and opportunities created by both the disruptions that you have talked about, but also the globotics revolution that Richard Baldwin talked about in the first session. And you've already given some ideas about how ASEAN countries uh, may respond to these challenges and opportunities, but I wondered if you could react to how um, perhaps either collectively or are, you know, whether they are going to take on this challenge collectively through, through the ASEAN mechanism, or are they going to deal with this individually uh, in terms of both challenges and opportunities? Well, I think we have it at different levels as always with ASEAN. So within ASEAN, uh, we obviously have, have had an agenda on ASEAN uh, digital, a digital ASEAN agenda, which talks a lot about data flows, about payment system, uh, even about taxation. Uh, but at the moment, it's more about transparency and trying to agree on some standards. Uh, so that, that's the direction. And then at the higher level, at the RCEP level, in the e-commerce agreement, also similarly, similarly still uh, more on transparency and you know, try to get to some agreement. If you talk about e-commerce, I guess at the moment there's no uh, ASEAN position. Actually, we, all, we have a kind of a mixed situation where some members of ASEAN have already signed on. And in fact, Singapore, I think, was one of the proponents of this plurilateral uh, e-commerce agreement. But a couple of countries, like Indonesia, uh, have, have not signed on. Uh, and we are still fi figuring out, figuring this out. And one of the contentious issues in there is um, taxation on electronic transactions, uh, which Indonesia, uh, at the moment, still feels that, that the, we should still continue that. We should not lift the moratorium, uh, uh, continue, uh, lift the moratorium and have permanent uh, exclusion of taxation on digital transaction. This is one of the big issues uh, in the discussion. Uh, but I think uh, payment system is going to be a very important uh, part of the discussion. And I think I'll just have time for one last question. I'm sorry I'm not gonna be able to get to them all, but um, the non-tariff barriers that we have seen um, within ASEAN countries, uh, both that, that have affected um, quite a bit of trade. I mean, obviously there's the New Zealand <laughs> dispute that has been um, still, you know, we, we have had a resolution, but do you see um, a trend or a particular way in which non-tariff non barriers within ASEAN, often on very sensitive issues, um, are likely to be able to be addressed? Uh, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we have a, a better um, rationale for uh, uh, imposing non-tariff measures and non-tariff barriers. Uh, and on paper, uh, at least regulatory-wise and legal-wise, Indonesia has a plan to reduce uh, its non-tariff barriers and non-tariff measures. Uh, some of the case, the case we had with uh, New Zealand and others on horticulture and beef uh, requires us to change the law. Uh, and that is supposed to be one, uh, one thing that we are doing. Uh, probably have to wait for the new parliament that will come in in September. But that's on the agenda, and I hope that was a big, good wake-up call that you can't just impose uh, restrictions uh, without uh, due process uh, and figuring out your international commitments. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission in the Indonesia actually came out with a ruling, and this was part of a whole um, review of the policies, that you should... Um, uh, just because a lot of the corruption cases were related to quota allocation uh, in beef. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the recommendation by the anti-corruption agency was the Ministry of Trade should uh, convert all quotas to tariffs. 
<laughs> that sounds music to economists' ears, right? <laughs> uh, uh, they, they are supposed to be in the process of removing all quantitative restrictions to you know, using tariffs uh, rather than quantitative restrictions. But I would say, the last thing I would say is that non-tariff measures need to be used properly in the sense that if you're using it for consumer protection, et cetera, et cetera, uh, standards, these are, that's legitimate. And, and we need to come up with a clear uh, guideline, if you like, uh, on, on the way you, you can, you need to review the non-tariff measure before you implement it. And, and that's actually something I know that internally the Ministry of Trade is trying to come up with. Uh, uh, the, the, the guidelines and the standard operating procedures to do that. Uh, in, even though it is part of our WTO transparency uh, notification, as well as in ASEAN, we actually are supposed to come up uh, with these uh, 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 guidelines. So uh, wish us luck that we can continue to pursue this for in the interest of greater transparency and so on. Well, thank you very much. That was a fascinating uh, presentation and a really informative set of responses to the questions. Um, I'd ask you to thank me, join with me in thanking Dr. Mari Pangestu for a really great session. Thank you.